Hi. Nice that you stayed. Um, Soda-san, let's start with you. Um, okay. I'm sure you have to lo have to say uh, uh, a lot about the, the film we just saw. Mm -hmm. um, maybe also about the other one. We will see later. Mm -hmm. mm, let's start with the big house. Um, there was an original ending, which you actually decided to cut out, um, right. showing a demonstration of pro-Trump pro protesters um, uh, outside of the stadium. No, anti-Trump anti protest. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Yep. Um, okay, yeah. There was this protest scene, uh, which you decided to cut out, and mm. there were heated discussions in the seminar about that scene. Right. Um, I think you were one of the people defending to leave it in. I was the only <laughs> person <laughs> defending to, to put it in. Yeah. And uh, but we voted in the end. We 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 uh, we had an ongoing discussion whether we should put that scene or not. Yeah. And I was the only defender of the scene. I shot it actually. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had a. Uh, I wanted to uh, put it in, but uh, we had an ongoing discussion, and uh, in the end, we we had to vote. And uh, we voted. Uh, we 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 thought this process was a democratic process mm -hmm. I mean the filmmaking itself because we are 17 directors mm -hmm. and um, I cannot decide on my own and uh, we decided to vote and uh, yeah I lost yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I, I like it um, the, I, I'm, I'm, I have no hard feeling about uh, about it because I, I ex express enough of myself and uh, I learned so much from the other point of views, I mean, opposite side, and uh, um, we, we, we had a process of, you know, processing it, and um, I'm happy about uh, the decision. Mm. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk about the arguments that were in play? Well, the, um, it's in your, fa uh, the one of the obvious uh, thing was that it was kind of very political, Political scene. I mean, you know, anti-Trump protests was con being conducted in front of the the stadium, and uh, it was a very small protest. Only uh, five or six people showed up. It was uh, right after the right after the election. You know, you know, uh, as you may know, that the Michigan was won by Trump, and but uh, only a few people, maybe five or six people, showed up to the protest anti-Trump protest and uh, doing the protest. Then uh, a lot of um, drunk Michigan fans who are, who are Trump supporters try, you know, started to harass them. And uh, it was a revealing scene to me. Um, but uh, it's in a sense, it has no subtlety of dealing with politics in the first 120 minutes. And um, and uh, that bothered um, uh, Marcus and also <laughs> Terry and uh, uh, Rachel. I think you were against it too, right? I was with you. You were with me? I was with you. Uh, really? Yeah. I okay. Did. I wasn't sure, but I ended up being with you. I mean, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I was not the only defender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So yeah, that was the scene. Yeah. So in this workflow, you were one of the auteurs, you could say, maybe. Mm. Um, I think one of the politics in play tonight is, mm. is basically author politics as well. Mm. So um, I think both films question the notion of one filmmaker being responsible for every artistic decision involved mm. in the making of the film. Um, in this case, there were many directors in the experimental film. There were two directors equally mm. credited as well. Um, I'm wondering, um, still... The film has your stamp, kind of. Uh, before right. the film starts, we have the stamp of Katsuhiro Soda, in a way. Right. Um, Observational number eight. Yeah, because uh, all number. of my films are numbered, and yeah. uh, this, uh, this is the eighth and yeah. latest, yes. I'm wondering, really, um, isn't there a contradiction between labeling the film <laughs> in that way and still <laughs> defending an idea of open observation and the politics of the group, in this case? It is a it is a contradiction. Yeah, I have to I have to admit. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, um, I edited the whole. I mean, I edited the film, and uh, uh, my view is quite reflected in this film. And uh, uh, also, 
uh, we decided to approach the shooting and editing in in the way I do. Um, uh, I instructed the students to to do in a similar way, and uh, so the method is very similar, the way I pr I approach, and uh, also um, when you try to get the film out of, out to the to the to the world, um, uh, it's more beneficial to have uh, uh, kind of like my stamp. Uh, to to appeal to the public. Yeah, uh, I was wondering about that actually. Yeah. If it's helpful for the for the project of the film to right. label it or associate. Yeah, it I feel. With I, your yeah. Body of work. yeah, I mean, I feel awkward to say it, um, mm -hmm. but uh, that's the reality of the film business too, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't cons I don't consider our films to be a commodity, but at the same time, it is a com commodity. And uh, we need to appeal to the public, you know, to get the audience to the theater. So that was another aspect of making the decision. Yeah, uh, Mathilde, as an editor, you've been working with uh, several directors who could be credited as auteur filmmakers, like Angela Schanelek for Orly and Wim Wenders as well, um, just to name a few. Um, I'm wondering on your about your perspective on that on that question. Um, do you think it's 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 helpful in terms of political filmmaking to have a film labeled as directed by this and this auteur? Although in your case, for example, I think you have a strong influence on the final shape of the film. Well, I'm sure you're right. I mean, a film, of course, has to be marketed and to be uh, sold and to attract audiences. And of course, if the name of the director is well known it'll certainly have another appeal than if it's in complete uh, unknown. And that's, for, that's for sure, and it's a wise decision. I, 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 I see that as well. Um, the thing is with the film, and I'm, that's very interesting, your, your project uh, in, in that aspect, is that I would have said, and I would continue to say in a way, that filmmaking is completely non-democratic. Right, exactly, yes. yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so you've, you've found yourself in, in a very interesting political experiment with this <laughs> film, in that you created a collective, or you decided to become a collective, all of you together, right. and uh, make a collective film, and then you had this ambivalence, of course, as to what to decide in the end. Is, it, is there a um, uh, main decision maker, and the editing, of course, is the moment where you, com you know, you you make the film and you make it the final version of the film that will right. always stay that way. So mm -hmm. you make all the important decisions about what you want to tell. Right. So you, being the editor of the film, also consolidates your um, your authorship, mm -hmm. and at the same time, you obviously in this situation um, caved into democratic principles. Right. <laughs> so. Um, it's an interesting situation, and I would say it's probably not completely resolved. No? That's right. In a way, of course, my, my experience with filmmaking is even though the ones who collaborate may have a an, an very important role to play, even a decisive role to play, as soon as there's someone who takes the responsibility for all of it, even if the person has not lifted a finger, and I'm not uh, at all suggesting mm. anything mm. like that, this person becomes de facto the author because right there must be one person mm. and this person has to uh, assume the responsibility for everything even though it may come from others mm -hmm. so there ne there is necessarily a hierarchy because it's about expressing a voice you know? so you wouldn't say it's even possible to exclude a position from a film uh, what do you mean of Sorry. an individual it's impossible to re remove the, the essential parts of the filmmakers, but it's also not possible to pretend there's not one person deciding in the end, yeah. I think. Unless you have, a, I mean, uh, probably in a situation where there's a duo deciding, where it's on an ongoing dialogue, maybe right. you could say so. But if mm. there's 17 people, yeah. I would say you have to have one deciding, uh, deciding uh, f entity. No? Um, how does that question influence your work as an editor? Like when you think... I'm representing a position, which is maybe not yours even. In no, no. Uh, yeah. As an editor, I completely fiercely defend what I think. You know, that's my, that's my mission. I will, uh, I will, be completely attuned to what I f uh, feel is right, and I will talk about it and uh, express it and and um, fight for it until the very last option. And if at some point, if the director says, "Well, I." 
I've seen your point, but I disagree. Well, then I, I have to admit that I didn't su succeed, but I will, of course, have pushed other points as well. And my, my m the mark that I leave is the impact of my contribution as uh, someone who has an, uh, an opinion, no? a very strong opinion. Mm -hmm. But still, the director is the one who takes the responsibility for whatever I have suggested and he has or she has taken into account. And I, I have a question, were there actually more moments like the one you described about the Trump um, protest, whether to leave it in or out, like moments where you as a collective decided to vote, like to, to cast a vote uh, on um, before making a decision? No, not, not at all. That was the only Yeah, moment. we were, we agreed on almost everything. Okay. We wow. didn't have too much like uh, arguments about whether, you know, how we, how we should how it should be done, mm -hmm. except for that ending. Mm -hmm. And the ending, I put it in from the very first cut, but every time we had a screening like a in, in, inside, inside the team, I always got the negative feedback. Mm -hmm. And also ambivalent feedback. Not everybody is 100% you know, opposed to it, but uh, everybody had some like, negative feeling about it and uh, always we talked about it and that concerned the question on how overtly political the film should be like how maybe implicit or indirect or versus very very explicit on the other hand or is, is that why there was this argument or this division on, on that point um marcus uh pointed out a good thing um good good point actually he told uh he said that uh, as soon as that you know trump protest com comes in um it takes over the whole film mm -hmm. and uh it's like a, uh, trump touches something and it gets ruined mm -hmm. and uh <laughs> it's true as soon as uh, <laughs> you see that like f the last seven minutes mm -hmm. it's it's only seven minutes long but uh after like if if you show after the test screenings um it maybe 90% of the argument was on that mm -hmm. seven, seven minutes. And uh, I saw it as a sign of a strong thing for debates. But uh, uh, Marcus, uh, correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, Marcus uh, thought that uh, it was a sign of uh, being taken over mm -hmm. by this very polarized you know, political situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the subtleties, all the issues we're dealing with in 120 minutes, it's gone, erased. I yeah. find that really interesting because when you were talking about direct cinema in the beginning, I was thinking, actually, to me, this film is more like indirect cinema mm. because it's like so approaching its subject <laughs> from the sidelines and like <laughs> staying on the sidelines, watching mm -hmm. the game from the sidelines, mm -hmm. uh, not <laughs> focusing, like I think Marcus said, film everything anything but the game right and so I, f <laughs> I felt like this really seems to be the rule for this cinema mm -hmm. and um, and I guess that also applies for for the way it's political uh, or how it how it expresses political or it has a political agenda it's very indirect very, and but, yeah. very implicit and mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was really interesting like mm. indirect direct cinema I think that's <laughs> also linked to the question of observation yeah um, by the way you are being observed by uh, a filmmaker here in the room who's directing a film on uh, soda Sun. so um, yeah she's yeah. been following me around you know forever actually yeah from new york and uh, we we, we fl flew together yeah. yeah that's sakuragi so uh, <laughs> observation and pro progress um elena you um you are researching um images which are not necessarily edited together in a, in a in a classical way as it would be the case in cinema so i'm wondering really about your perception of this film which um, claims to be observational, but at the same time, it's very strictly, in a way, editing the way you look at, and uh, you look and, and and at what you look, right? So, um, how does that feel for you? Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm really interested in the concept of observational documentary in with regard to this film and what what your concept concept of observation is, because what really struck me about this film is how much it actually. Um, is not only observational but observing observers because there's like so many um, 
photographers, cameramen, right. like media people in the picture. Right. So you're like constantly observing how others observe the scene, um, which to me like tells something about uh, the reality you are actually depicting, which is totally staged mm. or like a media event. Mm. It's not reality per se, but also like always already fabricated staged for right. images right so i was wondering how does that change your modus operandi or like what does that mean for you as a document documentary filmmaker who uh, adheres to observational documentary like how, what does it mean to observe something that is so made in order to be observed like <laughs> that, that that i guess that's probably also a difference to your other films or the film that is screening tomorrow in, right. in berlinale right. um because here it's like really a spectacle that is made to to be looked at well the um that's a very interesting observation by the way <laughs> the um the media people who are observing the uh, event um yeah and and but they, they are observing the event which is highly staged that's true but media people doesn't they, they don't think they are being ob observed so they are not staged so actually our um our policy of um or, or our motto of everything but the game uh, actually makes our observation more uh, genuine and authentic because I mean, the games, games, and everything that happens in the stadium is staged. But uh, you know, people who are observing, they are not staged. So um, it's almost like uh, we are we are documenting their unconscious behaviors, and uh, they think our cameras are one of you know one of them too. So they they don't think they, you know like uh, we are covering them. Yeah, so, that's what yeah. I thought, that your cameras don't really make a difference because there's so many cameras right. anyway, so your camera doesn't really change the situation, no. which is one concern documentary filmmakers have. But I was wondering, do you see, like, uh, do you see a difference between your way of observing mm. uh, and your camera mm -hmm. and the way these media professionals or m maybe not professionals, but just random people who take out their cell phones, how they observe? So would you say there's like a qualitative difference between the way th the cinema can observe an event like this to the way like t other media, television, uh, random cell phone images, um, how they look at li an event like this? I think our observation is more similar to these uh, people who are taking pictures with the cell phones. It's uh, uh, it's not it's it, it's uh, I think uh, because uh, when you take pictures with cell phones or in a casual way without uh, having to make a product visual product, you often discover something you don't even notice when you just look at the look at the reality like uh, without the camera, and uh, uh, I think our way of observation tend to be that way or we'd like to be that way we don't have the agenda we don't have the strict agenda we aim our camera when we are interested well when when we see something interesting and uh i mean we didn't do any research uh we we had a one scout location scouting so that we could get you know familiar with the place and uh, also we wanted to kind of uh, brainstorm uh, what to focus on you know what kind of uh, cheerleaders or you know marching band or kitchen or medical or whatever all kinds of aspects there are so many aspects of the stadium and uh, we did a scouting and we decided you know who's who's uh, who's focusing on what but we didn't we deliberately didn't talk about what to shoot or what kind of stories we are looking for and uh, we just let, you know, 17 people, including myself, go in the field and uh, shoot whatever interests us. At and the same time, um, this is a massive institution you are filming in, right? So mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of preparation to actually 
open all the doors in the film which seem completely open and the camera seems to float into every back door of the stadium. Right. I think there was a lot of preparation actually involved. Yes. I'm wondering a little bit whether the openness of the film, mm -hmm. it feels extremely open to me and very fluid, mm. um, if it's not actually a lie because you actually prepared this film a lot and you had to open all these doors yes. manually. Yes, uh, we had to do a lot of negotiations to get the access, yeah. And uh, I, uh, Marcus was the uh, person who was really uh, in charge of uh, doing the process. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that sense, yeah, we did a lot of preparations. But the difference is we didn't really talk about what to shoot or we, we try not to think about stories like, uh, you know, why don't we, let's say, like, a, why don't we shoot some sort of a sad story with, you know, uh, or, 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 or victorious stories or whatever. Like, a, you know, we didn't really set the theme. And uh, in this film, you see a lot of uh, um, themes of race or class or haves and have-nots and also uh, militarism or nationalism. There are so many keywords, uh, political Absolutely, keywords yeah. popping up, yeah. but uh, we never discussed it beforehand. It was w when people shot the shot the footage and come back to the class and we screen what, what people shot. And uh, students started to realize what they were shooting. And uh, they started to gain insight or point of views to what they shot. And uh, these keywords naturally popped up while we were screening all the footage. So, and then we, we started we, uh, we shot like five games in total. And uh, so every time we shot the game, we come back to the class and we discuss while watching the footage. And uh, so we go back to shooting again. And then, of course, this uh, discussion affects our, our, our point of view. And uh, so it affects, uh, it, it gets more sh sharper and sharper the, um, the, the way we see the stadium. So in that sense, yeah, while rolling the camera, or while shooting, it becomes a preparation for the next, next uh, shooting. Yeah. So in that sense, yeah, we, we are doing the research. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that's something we found while shooting and uh, while editing. And that's a difference, you know, whether, you know, if we decided to shoot like uh, before, before shooting, if, if we decided, okay, this, the theme of this movie is class mm. or race, mm. then uh, it becomes more like uh, in your head. I, I mean, it, you, yeah, it, it becomes kind of boring and, uh, and uh, you have no discoveries of, uh, uh, in the process. Sure. Yeah. Um, Mathilde, um, and everybody, I think, um, um, in a way, uh, yes, all these subjects are in the film. Um, I'm wondering sometimes whether it's not also a reproduction of problematic realities, um, which could be intervened by the filmic form, right? Um, but you decided not to intervene in any way or, or set a counterpoint or anything. Mm. I'm wondering, Mathilde, we were talking before that you didn't perceive the film as being a kind of political statement or anything, which I really enjoy about the film. Um, but you didn't feel like there was a position of the film towards these issues or? No, it's not, it, it's not that I was um, missing anything. It's just mm. that if, you know, in all the range of political films, I wouldn't have said that it's a political film at mm. first uh, mm. at first look no of course it's a it's a an immense kaleidoscope of uh, bits of fragments that create a very very striking portrait of america mm. and in that it's a sociological film one could say yes yes and sociology is of course inherently pol political yes right but it's not an in-your-face political film with an agenda at all mm. no? that's for sure so yeah i, w I was interested to <laughs> 
um, to find this film, especially this film, under the, the title of, of politics, because then it's very, very subtle and that's interesting. And I'm particularly surprised, a little bit sad even, to think that this interesting Trump scene <laughs> could have been at the end of the film and could have uh, shed another um, uh, facet you know, to the whole thing, because of course we see Trump uh, appearing like a shark spin right. <laughs> <laughs> through the film, but not very much. But yeah, so it, the, the political aspect is is in the um, is in the I would say the tender portrait made of people. You know, the the fact the fact that everyone, single person almost, is touching in themselves that they're human beings that you s start to like them right away and then you lose them, and you see this society, which is of course for someone who is not American or doesn't live in the U.S., is horrendously crazy. You know? But at the same time, uh, that's normality. Mm. You know? So that's that I would say that's where the political aspect is to be found. But it's it's not so much in the in any kind of social claim. You know that people are not paid well enough, or that you know even the haves and have not d don't seem that like they're suffering from the difference. So mm. it's it's more of a sub subtle. Right, it's right. very subtle. Yeah. yeah, we put it together with a different film, which is also linked to politics somehow. Um, but chooses a very different form of strategy, the experimental film in the end, which uses newspaper pages of a left-wing newspaper in Hungary um, as material um, to be included in the film. And it was published three days after um, the newspaper was shut down. Um, so that's I was wondering about your perception of this film. It's probably very far from your routines as a filmmaker right now. Right, Would yeah. Would you say so? Maybe you won't agree. Yeah, it's it's very different. I mean, I, you know, they didn't roll the camera either. I mean, they don't yeah. even roll the camera. <laughs> yeah, they work with still <laughs> images. I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I I found it interesting. Um, it's um, it's it makes a political statement. It's so obvious. I mean, the political uh, motive of this film of the film uh, short film. Is very obvious, I think, but uh, the way they treated um, that obvious was kind of vague and uh, you know subtle actually. So it's an interesting combination, I think. Yeah. Interesting is, uh, if I may, it's uh, it's like the the opposite of your film, right? The uh, complete opposite, right? Because <laughs> the the political aspect of the second film we watched is. And hundred percent in the concept and in the text, right, 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 right. and not so much in the emotionality because mm -hmm. there is quasi none, at least for us who do not understand uh, right. Hungarian, right, and who may uh, see maybe something in the text that could sus uh, have a reaction, create a reaction to to content, but yeah. since for us at least it's just graphic. Mm. It's very conceptual, and the whole political thing is in the statement at the right, end, right? right? Whereas in your film, there's no statement. <laughs> there's a refusal of any statement. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, the whole effect is in the emotionality or in the um, in the perception of, of life. No? So mm -hmm. it's like it's almost two opposites. No? So the, the second film also decides not to literally depict anything, right? Um, I'm wondering whether you perceive it as detached somehow. I perceive it as conceptual, and there's yeah, a. I mean, I've always um, had my uh, difficulties with conceptual art since. So you're just being polite. No, well, I, it's no. I, I really appreciate the beauty of the film. It's. It, I think it's a beautiful film, uh, and I. Th I also very much sy sympathize with the the impulse to make it. No, but somehow I'm more. I'm in my work and in my feelings, I feel more uh, akin to, I mean, fi clo closer to um, the transmission of meaning and of of uh, emotion through an object, uh, an aesthetic object that will um, give it to me in a nonverbal way, even if th if there's text or dialogue, but that will give it uh, in a general, in a, like a, in in its complete uh, effect on me. And of course, if uh, the problem with conceptual art is that it's all you can all condense it into words. It's just like it's a message. It's a it's a verbal message, mm. and the rest is just you Im you take that message and you project it onto what the rest of the work is. So it's a it's a completely other world. But and, and I of course I'm mm, I'm more in the the other one. 
I kind of also like The Big House better than the second film. I thought um, in, in this experimental film there was this strange tension between like the the timeliness of the film and like being an intervention to a an, uh, concrete political situation like the closing of that uh, Hungarian newspaper. But the aesthetics of the film to me seem very timeless or more like retro um, experimental film art from the 60s. So I, I couldn't really connect the two agendas, like the political ag agenda and the aesthetic agenda kind of, there was this disconnect for me. This could have, I don't know, that, that was for me a, a problem. I think uh, there's one point to make. Um, I think it's not necessarily a question of liking or not, but also about the system in which these films are created, right? Um, the second one was created in Hungary under a very repressive situation. Yeah. So for them it was in a way, I think, uh, an escape route to make a political context somehow, yeah. but maybe not directly. Right. Um, just saying. Um, yeah, uh, I, think I, think I, think yeah. I think you're very right. I mean, we're, we're talking like this, and we don't realize that aspect. Yeah, it's good you, s you s um, say that, because uh, there's probably a necessity to be veiled in, in, the, in the message. But the message is very clear, though. The message is clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uh, almost hard to mis mistake, yeah. mistaken. I yeah. agree. <laughs> but you can always cut it out, depending on the audience, <laughs> the ending. Um, yeah, wh while we are talking about uh, circumstances, um, I think openness, one of the subjects mm. of tonight, um, it's also sometimes a privilege, right? Um, yeah. So I was wondering, Mathilde, about your experiences when you worked on the Citizen Four film, uh, in which you really had not the privilege to work openly and uh, had to work with encrypted hard, dr hard drives, with encrypted email communication, and at the same time, at what Snowden underlined in the film, even in the film, that he didn't want to openly disclose all the information he had because he wasn't sure whether people were able to handle it, actually. So he wanted to have that position or design of information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you, can you talk a bit about that um, working situation? Yeah, I mean, um, so for those who don't know, the film Citizen Four is a documentary about the um, whistleblower Edward Snowden, who in 2013 leaked um, documents, top secret documents um, that proved that uh, the US um, spy agencies were spying on their own citizens uh, as a mass surveillance that was unconstitutional and, and also on the rest of the citizens in the world. And so when he disclosed this information, it was um, a cloak and dagger affair. The director of the film, uh, Citizen Four, Laura Poitras, went to meet uh, Edward Snowden uh, under very, very secret circumstances with two other journalists, and they filmed in uh, Hong Kong, in the hotel room where Edward Snowden was hidden. And um, I was uh, with my husband. <laughs> uh, we were in, in Berlin. We had already started working on the film before Edward Snowden had um, appeared in our lives uh, in the form of uh, anonymous encrypted emails. And we knew that there was this mysterious person that was uh, communicating with the director and uh, trying to pass on information and dis had decided in a, uh, all of us together that we should pursue that. And uh, so we were waiting very anxiously in Berlin. The film was uh, edited and also produced. I produced the film also with the, my husband and Laura. Uh, in Berlin, and um, we were waiting anxiously for news. Now that was the how how things unfolded, and of course we had to handle this very very uh, explosive material for a long time before the film came out, mm. and uh, so we worked under <laughs> uh, we were. <laughs> We worked under very, very secret uh, circumstances. We had to encrypt our hard drives. We had uh, to encrypt our communication. We often communicated ri by writing on little pieces of paper that we would then uh, burn <laughs> and wow. uh, these kinds of things because we had to make sure that for the time of the making of the film, we would not be... Uh, there was would be no interference. Also, we were working out of Berlin. Germany being one of the r relatively few countries in the world that has still uh, very good um, data protection laws. That was the reason. 
so yeah, so we were a, a little bubble. It was just Laura, the director, my husband Dirk, and I. For a very long time, we were just the three of us. We were working in our apartment for months, and we had um, a, a letter from Der Spiegel uh, stating that we were working for them, that we were journalists, so that we were protected by journalistic uh, laws covering, uh, uh, pr allowing us to keep the, the footage secret. So yeah, so that's the opposite. We were in a capsule of secrecy. But the interesting thing about openness and closed uh, circumstances is, is that we were, it, we were like in this air-gapped uh, bubble no? for a long time. And then, of course, at some point, we had to release the film. Mm. And so all this secret material we were working with went out in the world and were seen by wh whoever opened uh, the door to the theater, right? So it was for us, it was actually, for me, it was the biggest shock was to show the film the first time, the premiere. I was like, oh my, my God, these people m cannot watch this. <laughs> it's completely <laughs> forbidden. They shouldn't, they should. <laughs> but at some point you have to, to get rid of the, you know, to, to give it away in the world. Mm -hmm. And so even if it's very, very secret, at some point it's going to be public. That's so fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know anything about the film before I saw it. I only saw it only because uh, it was Laura's uh, new film. Uh, we knew kind of each other uh, before. And then when I, when I, when I was watching in the, in the theater, I was like, <laughs> jaw dropping the whole time. <laughs> and uh, must has been really, I mean, weren't you scared? I mean, you could be in war with the U United States government, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, young, we yeah. were. <laughs> you were, right? Yeah, 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 we were, and we were also very, very uh, cautious. We were taking no chances. And even during the production, because I actually at the beginning, when Laura reached out to me to work on this film, there was no Edward Snowden yet. He didn't, he hadn't uh, manifested himself. So the film was about surveillance, but it was more about Julian Assange and other whistleblowers. And so we were working on that film, but as soon as uh, Snowden came in, it became so, so explosive. Mm. And of course, there were, it became an international scandal and everything was uh, very much in the news every day. And for example, one day, um, the boyfriend of uh, Glenn Greenwald, who was a journalist who accompanied Laura in Hong Kong and who is also a protagonist in the film, came to visit us to give us some materials to work with and also to talk with us. And then he left us to go back to Rio, where they both live. And he went uh, over uh, London from, from Berlin. And he got arrested in, in, in Heathrow under terrorism laws, although he was just a journalist doing journalistic work. And he was uh, kept there for 10 hours. And he had no access to a lawyer. And so it was a complete scandal. And it was quite, yeah, it was scary. And we never went to the US for a long time during production. And, and and post production which were which were happening at the same time, and um, yeah, but at some point, uh, yeah, all of this went out in in just in, uh, the film was released and everything was different. I'm surprised you are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, uh, at some point, uh, the thing is, uh, as soon as the thing became public, there, as soon as something become actually again openness and closed things, as soon as something becomes very very public you're protected, no, in some way. But of course, I'm not going to in inflate my role here. I mean, we, could be we can be surprised that Edward Snowden is alive, yeah. right? That's, that's the big thing. Yeah. And he said himself that his best case scenario was that he would spend the rest of his life in jail. So he was expecting also possibly to be murdered. But the fact that it all went so public so quickly and so, so explosively probably pr protected him as well. So in that case, there was quite a big requirement to stay open as well, right? In the process of creating the film to changing circumstances. Yeah, the thing w that we, we did right away, that Laura did, but we did it in a way together, was that when, s when she was in Hong Kong, she uh, created this little film of Edward Snowden saying, my name is Edward Snowden, I'm a contractor with NSA and s stating what he is and what he was going to disclose. So while she was still in Hong Kong, she, w she brought out this uh, little film that made it immediately hyper public. And from then on, it w he became a public figure and it became immediately more difficult to just 
snuff him out in a way. But I'm sure there were discussions about that somewhere. Um, talking about U.S. circumstances, um, Sodasan, I'm wondering, um, you've been living uh, in New York since 1993, and in all of your documentaries, you never, as far as I saw, focused on the U.S. Right. This is the first one. Um, this is the first yeah, one. So I'm, I'm really curious about your decision to mm. always go back to Japan to film there. Right, uh, right. Well, um, it was a coincidence. Um, I... I, I don't believe you. Yeah, it is. It is in my courses. I mean, um, you know, uh, I, I told, uh, I, uh, as I said, I have 10 commandments, and uh, one of them is I don't do any research. I don't really look for subjects or characters. So meaning uh, I need to rely on personal connections or, or acquaintances or like accidental encounters. And my first film campaign was made only because my... Uh, a uh, college classmate uh, dis decided to run for for election in Japan, and uh, I ho overheard it, and I asked him if I can shoot the campaign, and he was backed this uh, he was backed by this uh, biggest party of Japan, so um, and uh, they are the most traditional, uh, like uh, getting more right wing kind of. Uh, political party now and uh, I mean they're the most dominant party of Japan and you know all the prime ministers almost all the prime ministers are coming from this party so I was interested in you know making a film um, of his political campaign and uh, second one mental was also through my acquaintances my wife Kyoko's mother worked with the doctor of, uh, of uh, 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 psychiatrist uh, mental clinic in Okayama, in Japan, and uh, through her, I got acquainted with the doctor and also patients. So yeah, everything I kind of shot was through my kind of encounters, personal encounters, and the big house was also like uh, through the personal encounters. I didn't really pick big house to to be our subjects. It was Marcus's idea, and uh, he was he wanted to. Do, it was his dream to make a film about the big house. And uh, he invited me as a professor, a visiting professor for one year to, to teach, co-teach this class, this seminar. And uh, I had no idea about football. I mean, I've never, I've never saw a football game before. I don't even know the rules. So I wasn't sure you know, what kind of film it's going to be. I, I had no idea. But uh, I jumped to, to the train. I mean, like uh, I had an instinct that uh, yeah, this could be a great film. Um, uh. I, I was, uh, what I like about the film is that it seems to be like an example of autoethnography or something, like American students yeah. apparently kind of looking at their own culture right. as if it was like some weird tribe and mm -hmm. have with like strange <laughs> rituals. And so I was wondering how, like, how did you get, get them to have that? Um, uh, new look at or like that new gaze at something that should be very um, close to them and like very very known to them um, did, did you have like certain mechanisms of teaching or of like kind of alienating them to their own culture or, or uh, so I, I guess I, w I was wondering like how how did your teaching uh, work and mentoring this film like um, well um the class was designed to have not only this, the making of this film, but also uh, Marcus taught the history of uh, direct cinema and also theory of the direct cinema and also all the ethical issues. And uh, also we watched all the direct cinema masterpieces. Um, and it was a, we had three classes uh, every, every week. So we, um, we were able to integrate uh, practice and theory and history and ethics. So, you know, uh, students can get all the point of views from the direct cinema masterpieces, like, you know, oh, wow, just to look at the uh, things without commentaries, you can discover so many things. And, uh, you know, they have this perfect, you know, subject to look at, so they can do the same. 
So I think it was a success of the designing of the of the of the uh, of the class, and also you know if you become a a camera person and start shooting, then you start to examine what you're looking at. You know every day we live our lives and we don't really look at things. We just pass by because we have purposes. For example, if you're going to the, to the subway station to get to work, the purpose of walking is just to get to the subway station. So you don't really look at things that, that's in between, right? I mean, you don't really look at, wow, this ground is asphalt, or oh, wow, there is a sign over there. Wow, th th that's a red line, a uh, red, red light, or, I mean, you don't, you don't do that, right? But uh, once you have a camera, once you have a camera, you start doing that, like, uh, because y you have to be conscious about what you're shooting. You have to think about, what did I shoot now? And uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's also natural that if you start, you know, having a camera and, you know, being open to, yeah, open, being open to what you see, then uh, you discover. So uh, I really uh, enjoy working with the students because I thought it was, uh, um, I didn't expect that, actually. I mean, I, did, I wasn't sure. It could be, uh, you know, I thought it could be very difficult for people to do that, but uh, they did it. Um, and uh, I was really happy when they came up with uh, all these footage. I didn't even think of shooting. Um, if I were alone uh, with one camera, I didn't have this kind of film, no way. Um, there are so many scenes I didn't even think about shooting, and uh, so um, I uh, I'm very happy about you know how pe you know students reacted to our proposal and uh, uh, use their brain and point of views to find you know something interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, before I ask the last question, I want to open the floor as well. Um, if there are any comments questions, suggestions. Now is the time. There's one. There's a mic coming your way. Just a second. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting film. About the second film, I just want to say it's OK. But it could have been another comment. Uh, remember, every day 200 uh, languages die, 200 newspapers die. Remember, it would fit also. So I don't want to talk about the second film too much, it's a, okay, it's a statement, okay. But for the first film, when I say, um, I think this film was interesting, this includes a kind of critique uh, by my side. My idea is it was an addition of interesting things that interested students saw a lot of interesting things and uh, you, you encouraged them to, to, to show and to talk about things they were interested in. And um, to my opinion, these, is, these elements, we call it kaleidoscope, didn't fit together, and so it became a film in my mind. I saw elements. I want to talk about two elements. Um, before I w was thinking about the Trump thing, I, I, I thought this way of a military uh, uh, routine of the students was a very aggressive and ritualized way of moving. I thought something very... I felt something very strange about it and was feared about it. Um, the second one, um, you decided, or uh, one of your camera authors decided to s watch the scene from the corner of the bowl, or of, of the open house. And something became a, a kind of view at things from above that was as interesting and for me very um, uh, uh, thrilling, uh, like coming from down, from, uh, from the heaven, you know? Coming down from the heaven, and I thought something, I thought those people who gave signs like this, you know, they try to communicate with something above. And um, in this, in this um, scenes, I had the idea of, uh, of, of getting a political uh, feeling about, about, about what happens there. Uh, but it was uh, already said by, by the two ladies, um, it didn't become a, 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 a cinematical approach to, to, to 
to see the open house. I didn't see no house. I see no openness. I saw a lot of interested views at small pieces of uh, something I didn't see in the whole. So openness is not enough? So openness is not enough? No, it, it, w it wasn't open, you know. For instance, um, sometimes you see, you see a films about uh, uh, cruising ships, you know, people making journeys about, and you see the people working in the kitchen and the, the home, the ladies uh, preparing the rooms. You see, oh, it's, it's a machine, it's a machine. It's maybe I, I could see this, this open house was a machine, but I didn't, I didn't see no soul, you know. In you mean big house? The big, big house, house yeah. the big house, yeah. What's 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 moving this machine? Is it something, organization? Is it is it uh, commerce? Is it uh, make a business or is it the alumni? You know, it was no idea of what really made this American, you know, ritual work. I didn't feel it as a film. Very interesting, particular, wonder wonderful, but it wasn't. It wasn't for me uh, a filmic. Uh, an idea of, of, of a space, a room. It's, awesome. <coughs> it's interesting be because in a way we're touching about the subject of direct cinema at its core. No? Right. Direct cinema is <coughs> exactly, if I understand your reaction, is exactly to present to, pre to, to present in a way that it that feels as neutral as possible mm -hmm. bits of reality, but may I may not have the definition of s direct cinema perfectly in my mind. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's the idea. No? The idea is that there is no uh, there is no message that's going to to sew all of this together, but we are presented with with impressions, and that it's the ball is in the field of the viewer to to deal with it in a way, no? Is, is that actually the intent? Well, um, my interpretation is that uh, we don't make statements, mm -hmm. but uh, we show our point of views. Point of views, point of views and statement are different things. Mm -hmm. Statement is like, you know, you can say in verbal words, right? But, uh, point of view is more ambiguous, you know. It's where you put the, your camera, on what and how, which angle. And uh, uh, images are open to many different interpretations by nature. Even though you show the first, I mean, the same image of of, of uh, same person, um, some people might think, oh, he looks like a kind person, and maybe another person might see the opposite, or he, he, he looks mean. And that's the nature of images, right? So uh, when you show only the point of views of the filmmakers, uh, um, it, it, it's open to so many different interpretations. And uh, uh, that's the, for me, that's the strength of direct cinema. But uh, for, uh, it's also a limitation of direct cinema because sometimes, uh, it dep depending on the, the audience uh, or viewer, I mean, obviously it didn't click on to you uh, as a one coherent uh, film, film experience. But uh, 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 in our mind, uh, we had uh, some coherence uh, from the very beginning to the end, and uh, we see some clear threads uh, in uh, as a film, uh, but uh, uh, it's not necessarily conveyed to everybody uh, in the in the in the in the room, and uh, that's. But that's. Uh, Is there? I mean, um, going back to this example, that's yeah. quite striking of mm. the last scene with an anti-Trump right. protest. I have the feeling there was even on your side a deliberate, I mean, on the side of the collective, you know, yeah. a deliberate attempt to not draw the film in one direction. Is right. That right. Yeah. So you preferred to not have elements in the film that that 
make it coalesce mm. around an idea. Mm. But you you decided uh, consciously, if I understand correctly, to let leave it very very open. Yes, right? leave it open, yeah. leave it open. And it's actually it um, it requires uh, on the side of the audience to read uh, what you see. And um, there are so many American things. Actually, I realized you know in this room. Uh, because I'm in a foreign country than America. Mm -hmm. So it's really American culture we are looking at. Yeah. And uh, so many elements of it are very foreign to, to non-American people. And I'm, I'm not American, but uh, I've been you know, living there for 24 years. So I gained very similar point of views, but uh, not necessarily, you know, for example, you know, the college um, in Europe, you know, I mean, public universities are maybe very cheap or, or free, right? I mean, if, when you go to a college. But University of Michigan is a public university. It's supposed to be state-funded, but the funding from uh, the state of Michigan is only 16% of the whole budget, 16%. So everything else is coming from tuition, or something else, right? So tuition is very expensive, even though it's a public university. You pay uh, 15,000 a year? 15,000 dollars or euros a year. That's in state. In state. And out of state, it's like 50,000? 40, 50,000 a year. I mean, so you, you cannot pay for the public university if you are if you're not rich so then how do you right how okay right right yeah so yeah the and the, the and the the economy of the university is supported by all the donations and uh, the, uh, remember the speech mm -hmm. of the president of the university in the end? They, he's solidizing the, uh, the donation from the alumni. And uh, it depends on these people whether the university survives or not. And uh, you know, this uh, football game is a really important event for the university to attract alumni mm -hmm. to to cut the paycheck i mean to to cut cut the checks mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so university i mean it's it's just a you know sports but it's not a sport it's it's not just a sport mm -hmm. it's it's a tool or machine to attract uh alumni and their donation and money and uh it's really a uh, very American way of running things. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, you know, all these uh, TV crew, you know, they are paying so much license, I mean, licensing fees, like for, to the university. That's a big, big uh, chunk of income. And that's why they even invite uh, Coach Harbor. Uh, he, he is constantly on the, on, the, on the screen. Coach Harbor, He's paid for nine million dollars per per year because they need to win. Even uh, you know, it's it's a necessity for them to win to attract donations. So that's you know that's a b investment they make to keep the university going. I, I think that was really striking how you put that speech of the president right. at the end, and he talks about his school or the mm -hmm. college in terms of numbers and like quantifiable. Um, numbers right. um, and, right. and finances, I thought that was really interesting. Mm. And it, in that way, it becomes a film on education right. and the edu educational system, yes. too. But I have another, like, um, uh, like kind of um, continuing on to what you said, like the idea of openness, to me, also raises questions of, like, complicitness. Um, you, you kind of stressed that your uh, way of approaching filmmaking, to you it's really important not to distance yourself from your subjects or not to distance yourself from what you see. Right. But on the other hand, that also raises to me the question like, m 
how do you become complicit to what mm. you see? Mm. And to me, this film is like really about America as spectacle, right. like a society of the spectacle. Um, everything's staged, made um, for for images. Mm -hmm. And and so I was wondering uh, how how much is or in which moments might your film maybe also be complicit to these mm. images? And I thought so very much in the big in the first shot like the right. drone image right. uh, jumping from the right. helicopter or right. the airplane or something. And also in the last shot, which mm. is this overhead right. op bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel like, well, that's, that's kind of the perspective you're supposed to um, take. That's how you see the spectacle. That's how you see like people um, coalescing, people being choreographed to make the M sign, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a very inhuman perspective maybe. Right. And you chose to put that shot at the end of your film uh, and even like fast forwarded and make it kind of cute mm -hmm. and, and pleasurable mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. so I was wondering um, how much you like kind of perpetuate the pleasure of these spect spectacular images and maybe sometimes not um, not draw a line or like not put enough distance between those your film and those images yeah that's a good question I mean even I was while I was shooting uh, at the stadium, um, uh, I felt moved by what I see. Uh, you know, you know. Can you imagine 100,000 people together in one place, wearing very similar clothes and uh, chanting the same songs? Were you not scared? <laughs> it's scary, but at the same time, you feel good, and that's scary, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, probably, especially in Germany, probably you have, you know, uh, the history of, uh, you know, um, uh, World War II, and uh, you probably have this uh, education that uh, you don't, you know, you to to stay away from that kind of stuff. So you might, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, in the United States, there is no, no, not not that that kind of point of view is very very. Um, uh, in the background, it's not basically, you know, like uh, the country did haven't suffered. Uh, I mean, they at least they don't think uh, American. Most American people don't think that uh, they have suffered the same kind of consequences because of war. Um, the country was created by war, and. Uh, the founding uh, principle and uh, the way they found found the country was through fighting, and so yeah, it, it's if but you. It's interesting because America is like it has this ideology of the individual and individualism, right. yeah. and everything you it's see a, here is yeah. like people like in the same colors in uniform. Basically, yeah. everybody is in uniform, like the cheerleaders, the musicians, the fans, the right. players. So um, it's a contradiction. That, and that's really interesting about the film that it kind of makes that visible. Yeah. And the contradiction is interesting. I mean, we are contradiction. I mean, human beings are very complex. We are so complex that we can't really like a uh, I mean, we do things that, that contradicts itself. And uh, we are okay with it. So we wanted to show that complexity as we see it. And, um, and that was our our, I think that was our desire. At least it was my desire. And uh, of course, some people might, th might feel that, oh, this is a propaganda for the, for the university, you know, complicity. We are complicit of the cause of the university, but some people might see in an opposite way uh, because we are showing um, such themes as you know class class society or or or, or race issues or or consumerism or uh, the system of running the university and and uh, yeah if you go to the kitchen you see the difference between like. Uh, uh, chef and also uh, wash, you know, dishwashers, and, and so all these point of views are not so. Um, uh, we are not really. We don't have this uh, desire to praise the university, or we don't really use the film to as a tool to promote the university. No, so, yeah. 
Um, we have two more questions from the side. Uh, I have a short question of understanding before I uh, put my uh, real question. Uh, you say you have had 17 teams of uh, cameras, but I understand you had at least one uh, shooting which is not uh, produced by them. I guess the guy who sprang off the uh, uh, airplane with the parachute right. Right. is not one of the 17 teams. Is that, is that right? Right. Okay. So yes. In that sense, I think to achieve your goals uh, of this direct cinema, so what you did is uh, just you organized the access and you post-edited it, the post-production. That's, that's all what you did. You didn't think about how to shoot it. You didn't have any concept. So why didn't you just make a uh, call for contributions or visual contributions? There were 110,000 uh, spectators and I guess around 10,000 people who worked there. <laughs> so you would have had 120,000 uh, potential <laughs> iPhone uh, or whatever, uh, <laughs> say, uh, cameras available, and you would have got at least a few thousand of uh, contributions, and just editing them, you might have done a much better film. That's a great idea. You should try. <laughs> uh, my second question is, uh, are you going to release that uh, not uh, shown part uh, with the Trump protest on Vimeo or so? Can we see it? Uh, we'll, we are planning to include that scene in the DVD or um, uh, as, a, as a deleted scene, yeah, yeah. But uh, as a film, yeah, we will we release this version, yeah. Frederick? Um, I just wanted to, um, um, to add a little thing to what um, Vanna Husica was saying because I had the feeling that it wasn't really received. Um, I think it's a legitimate criticism that I wouldn't share, but um, that there is not, um, that the film does not have one point of view, but many point of views. And in this way, it works really in a contradiction to um, how cinema and documentary cinema mostly is conceived as um, something that follows um, uh, an, an authorship and a, and a, and a um, cinematic vision and I, I'm sure that you share a lot of visions together with these um, uh, 16 other parties but of course um, it's, uh, it's very it's, a, it's, 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 it's an op opposition to uh, conventions of what cinema is um, usually and also to what uh, usually is shown in festivals and I'm um, uh, one of the things when we were discussing um, our selection and when we decided we wanted to show this, it was important to us to think about what usually is represented at film festivals. And maybe, maybe you could say a few sentences about this that um, uh, compared to what your other works are um, and how this um, different kind of authorship and different kind of concept of film might also um, make it difficult to be visible or to be recognized in s particular uh, in different kinds of um, venues, um, maybe echoing um, the criticism that was um, uttered before. Um, well, authorship. Um, there is a question about like uh, you know who is the author of the film, and. Uh, um, it's actually by nature uh, used to be. I mean, it's been a collaborative efforts, right? I think you know that's the that's the actually more like the nature of of cinema. But for some reason, you know, director uh, this you know became the author is considered you know considered to be the author. And uh, but in fact, you know, there are so many people working on the project. No, you know, yep. you know, editors contribute so much to the film, and uh, I think we did pretty much like the same thing. Actually, I didn't really feel too different about uh, about making a traditional film with many people. Uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, how we treat the credit credits. Uh, usually, you know, one director or two directors maybe uh, get the credit of directors, but we decided to share the credits uh, as directors because each scene was directed by each person. 
right? I mean, I didn't, I didn't direct them to, to shoot in a certain way. Nobody, nobody did it. Uh, so, you know, 17 people had their own point of views and uh, shot the footage and edited um, uh, the segments. Of course, I tweaked and I, I manipulated everything so that it could be seen as a, uh, as a, as a coherent you know, one, one long film. But everybody kind of uh, directed their own scenes. So that's why we decided to give credits to, to everybody as a director, right? And, uh, but that's not so different from, you know, she, she's credited as an editor. It's not so different. I would say that actually the more we're talking about the film, the more I'm realizing what my first impression was, which I didn't really bring to my conscious mind um, immediately, which is that it's, it is very, as it is a ver sub subtly, a very, very unusual film. Yeah. Um, but it's on the surface you you would say you wouldn't reali realize because mm. it does have the appearance of a, a documentary as right. you could see them, but you do feel that it's not the same pair of eyes that looks at all these different things, and that it's not also work for hire camera people who mm -hmm. you know who do um, who just film what they're supposed to. You s you do feel that it's a personal uh, pa uh, a personal mind you know mm -hmm. that, that goes about and th finds things mm. you do feel that yeah and so it's like a multiple uh, it's a planetarium of of impressions but the thing is that since you have this extremely strong uh, subject which mm. is one uh, that unifies uh, space and time you know you have the the game the preparation of the game until the game and after and you have this one place it unifies the thing so much that it do it gives the impression of being a classical film, right? But very, very subtly, there's something um, where you ask yourself, "What, what was this?" No? Mm -hmm. But I actually, I must say, I, I like it very much, mm -hmm. and I also, what I appreciate very much is this immersion into a reality that is so, yeah, so so overwhelming no? mm -hmm. because you there's so many things going on at the same time and so many. Uh, striking, surprising realities. So it's like I it's like an immersion, and then you have you become like this many many headed creature, mm -hmm. which looks at things with many many different pairs of eyes. Right. So it's uh, actually it's a very unusual film. I'm realizing more and more. I <laughs> call it a uh, cubist cubist film. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. because, because yeah, you're looking at yeah, things yeah. yeah from different seventeen point of views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Elena, do you perceive the film as a critique in any way? Um, yeah, I'm Since I'm we're at Critics Week, I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tempted. No, I, I, I guess I, I already said what I, um, uh, how I see the film, and I do perceive it as a critique. I mean, I'm, I, as a spectator, am, I am able to extract all these things that I already said. I kind of see this country in uniform, um, totally invested in the spectacle. They're like detach from any real reality whatsoever so i can that that can all be construed as as being like the the critic the, the critical agenda of the film um in in that point yeah but but i already said i have some some um ambivalence on on some decisions and some like um use of some images some material but uh, somehow i the film made me think of of a totally different film spring breakers which is like a fiction feature film but also about like america as spectacle and like kind of um trying to think about how to deal with these images that that are produced like mass production images and like how bodies are um orchestrated and and kind of um made and so i i see some uh, some resonance between um this film and and a film like spring breakers but maybe that's just my personal um the the movies that i have in my head thank you yeah um, i hope we tempted you to stay open to different kinds of cinematic strategies and i hope we managed to complicate some of the terms linked to this film and others, we are going to show more of them uh, in quite an eclectic mix, I think. So I hope you're going to be challenged a bit in the next days. Um, yeah, we'll have drinks in a bar nearby now. So in case you want to join, I'd love to have a longer conversation with you there. Um, thank you again.
to our guests, Katsuhiro Soda, Thank you. Mathilde Bonfoy, and Elena Meilecke. Thank you. See you again. Goodbye. Thank you.